to the second of your time. I want to say thank you very much. I think we have a great, uh, a great uh, event today. It has been helped probably a little bit by the market. Uh, the, yeah, the timing is really couldn't be better, so thank you very much for making this an, another great success. Uh, special thanks, of course, to uh, our partners, DNB. It's the fourth year we're partnering for this event, and we're delighted to see that it's growing in terms of quality and quantity every year. And thank you to every other sponsor and participant, and of course, thank you to uh, the DNB staff and to the Capital Link staff for uh, working hard to put this together. And with, uh, without any more delay, I would like to uh, invite uh, the Honorable Mark Busby to the podium, uh, the Admiral retired. Uh, he is the Maritime Administrator from the, US State, uh, from the United States Department of Commerce. He was appointed by President Donald Trump and sworn in as Maritime Administrator on August 8, 2017. So he has been in this position for a bit more than two years. And without going through his very long and very distinguished career, I will only say that uh, prior to his appointment, he served as president of the National Defense Transportation Association, a position that he has held since retiring from the U.S. Navy in 2013, and please notice that, with 35 years of experience. So we are delighted to have uh, a, a real veteran with us in terms of uh, experience. Uh, thank you so much for uh, making the, tr the trip from Washington. We're actually delighted to see the U.S. government support of this event because we had uh, another tremendous panel today with a U.S. government update on tariffs and sanctions. So without any more delay, Admiral, thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Nicholas. And, uh, for that very kind in invitation. It is very much a pleasure to be with you all here uh, this afternoon uh, to discuss the work we're doing at the Maritime Administration to uh, strengthen the American maritime industry in an increasingly competitive and uh, contentious world. I also bring greetings from my boss, uh, the Secretary of Transportation, Elaine L. Chow. Uh, we could not have a better champion uh, for U.S. Maritime and Secretary Chow. As you all well know, she comes from a uh, distinguished family of, uh, of maritime experts. Her father, uh, Dr. Chow, is well known uh, to this uh, community and this industry, and uh, she is an absolute delight to work for. And when I go up to brief her on various things, uh, you know, I, I am at the graduate level when I talk to her, and uh, I know I have to have my P's and Q's in order because she goes right to the Right to the point. Uh, of course, it's always a pleasure to be outside the Beltway in Washington, D.C., uh, and to visit New York, uh, particularly because the port of New York and New Jersey uh, is the epicenter of many exciting developments. Not only is the port the busiest on the East Coast, handling more than 3.6 million cargo containers of goods worth nearly 200 billion, of course, it means it remains a center for global maritime finance which is why you're here. Also, as a leader in innovative uses of Americans' marine highways, and we heard a little bit about that at one of the panels this morning, which we believe can help reduce road congestion by moving more and more cargoes onto our domestic waterways, which we are so very well blessed in in this country to have such an extensive waterway system that's quite underutilized. If there's anything uh, that can help reduce traffic congestion around New York City, that would certainly be a welcome change. Short sea shipping can also boost the maritime industry and support American mariner jobs. More cargo means more ships. More ships means more mariners. And together, that supports America's national and economic security. I know that you spent mo uh, much of the morning on international maritime challenges. And we're heavily focused on those issues, too. From environmental and safety issues to trade, autonomous vessels, wind energy, and LNG, the global nature of our industry requires cooperation across borders and oceans. So your work and discussions are helping to advance solutions to these shared challenges. Closer to home and central to the Maritime Administration's core mission, 
Our agency is working diligently to address serious, persistent challenges to the U.S. maritime industry that affect both our economic and national security. You know, America was founded as a maritime nation, but through our history, we've seen our naval and commercial maritime power wax and wane. That's problematic because, as famed naval strategist Admiral, Admiral Alfred Thayer Mahan observed, control of the sea by maritime commerce and naval supremacy together means pre predominant influence in the world. I believe that Mahan's words remain true. Global influence is tied to the strength of both our Navy and our U.S. flag commercial fleet. It's about growing our economy and protecting ourselves, our allies, and our interests around the world. You know, uh, I was recently speaking to a group of young Army officers a uh, week before last at headquarters. We get groups of them to cycle through from time to time. And I posed the question to them, how do you think you get to war? These are Army officers. How do you get to war? How do you get overseas when our country needs to deploy you overseas? After some very blank stares, these are very junior officers, I got to give them credit, but after some very blank stares, I told them that while a few of them may go in the back of a C-17, the predominance of their combat maneuver forces, the rolling stock, the tanks, the trucks, the heavy artillery, and all the sustainment that goes with it, would get there in civilian ships predominantly, manned by volunteer civilians. That was, that was a real news break, neural news flash for many of them. Virtually everything that the military requires in a deployment moves by ships. Some of them are government owned, and we have about 61 government owned ships uh, that we run. I run 46 of them. The military seal of command runs 14 of them. So we have that government owned cadre. But our commercial merchant marine has a very unique mission, and that is military sea lift. To sustain sea lift and an extended deployment, the American military must rely on our commercial vessels. That's why many of us are speaking up about the state of the U.S. flag shipping and its relationship to our national defense. By any measure, the United States Navy service that I served in for over 34 years remains number one in the world. But that's only half of Admiral Mahan's sea power equation. The other half is that commercial fleet, and it's not where it needs to be. In fact, of the more than 40,000 large ocean-going merchant ships of all nations currently sailing internationally, only 82, 82 are U.S. flagships. That puts us at number 22 in the world. These vessels employ the highly skilled, unlimited tonnage mariners we need to crew both the government-owned ships and the commercial sea lift ships. Fewer U.S. flag ships means fewer mariner jobs and fewer trained mariners for sea lift. Plain and simple, I need more ships, and we need more mariners to sail them. I've testified before Congress on several occasions that I believe we are about 1,800 mariners short for a project a protracted sea lift operation, one that lasts more than four to six months. Programs like the Maritime Security Program, or MSP, are designed to ensure that we maintain an absolute bare minimum of commercial sea lift capacity and access to the global logistic networks that come with them to serve our nation's needs in times of emergency. We do that by offering about 60 U.S. flag ships a modest $5 million per year annual stipend to remain under the U.S. flag. So, so if you remember that math, 82 U.S. flagships sailing internationally, 60 of them are receiving a stipend to remain under U.S. flag. As I remind my friends in Washington, and I use that term loosely, <clears throat> it is a challenge to remain under the U.S. flag when the annual cost differential between operating under a U.S. flagship and that of a flag of convenience or foreign flag is nearly six and a half million dollars per year, cost differential. Because foreign flag shipping is often highly subsidized or 
benefits from a very um, conducive tax uh, incentives. We've got to help level that playing field uh, for our ships to be able to compete, and MSP helps us do that. Cargo preference statutes, which guide 100 percent of Department of Defense cargo and at least 50 percent of non-military U.S. government cargo aboard U.S. flagged ships if they are available, are key elements of the U.S. flag equation also. I would add that the U.S. fleet also depends on competing for non-government cargo as well. The more the private sector uses American Ocean Shipping Services, the more cargo our U.S. flag carriers get to haul. And with more cargo comes more ships, more ships comes more sailors, more sailors comes more ability to support our sea lift forces. Now, I can't stand here this afternoon without mentioning the Jones Act and its vital importance to the health of the maritime ministry and our national security. Now, I know there will be some differences of opinion in this room when it comes to the Jones Act, but let me be very clear where I stand on the Jones Act and where the President stands and where Secretary Chow stands. Jones Act is the fundamental cornerstone of our nation's maritime policy, and it has been for the last 99 years. Its relevance in addressing national security issues is as strong today as it was a century ago in 1920, even as the way it directly impacts national security has evolved. Back in 1920, it was all about having enough ships available to do a sea lift mission and support uh, this nation going to war. Now it's not the ships, it's the mariners. I need the mariners. I need the mariners that serve on those Jones Act ships to support our sea lift operation. <clears throat> in addition to the 100 large ocean going vessels in the Jones Act fleet, it supports roughly 41,000 smaller vessels in domestic service, all built and repaired by American workers with a collective 73.8 million tons of cargo capacity. It's an American jobs machine, resulting in 54 billion in U.S. economic output and supporting the employment of nearly 650,000 Americans. Those jobs are very much on our minds due to our sea lift requirements, but also because these are good paying jobs, American jobs that can support a family. It's very much in keeping with President Trump's maxim that economic issues are national security issues, and national security issues are economic issues. You won't see a sector of our economy that better or more accurately reflects the maxim, that maxim, than the maritime industry. As a former naval officer, as a proud graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, and now as the head of the Maritime Administration, I've had a very unique vantage point to observe close up how the military and commercial sides are intertwined, both sides of Admiral Mahan's equation. We're also reminded daily of how maritime affects world events and world events affects the maritime. This audience grasps that more than most. You've got investments, companies, and jobs on the line with every new headline in the papers and breaking story on cable news. You're involved in this industry at a turbulent time in international affairs and in industry itself. You know, we may very well look back at this period as a major inflection point in the history of maritime industry. It's an industry as old as time. It's one marked by a spirit of independence, but it's also slow to change. But the speed of change is reshaping this industry. We are now under pressure to innovate rapidly to be cleaner, to be more efficient. The global nature of the industry requires increasing cooperation. And the technology being developed is leaps and bounds ahead of where it was when I walked out of Kings Point in 1979 with now precision navigation, autonomous technologies, and other advances coming online. We might be witnessing a shift as monumental as that from sail to steam. So it's an exciting and tumultuous time in the industry, but I'd say that Admiral Mahan's words still ring true. You can trust that all of us at the Maritime Administration are leaning into the challenges to help to grow the U.S. Maritime Ministry and to protect the nation to the best of our abilities. 
Thank you all very much. Enjoy your lunch.